Um, hi guys, this is the Hacker Noon podcast, and today we have a host of guests with us and a Hacker Noon contributor serving as my co-host. Uh, I'll be joined by Devakar Gupta, who is the head of engineering at Blockstack. He holds a PhD in computer science from San Diego. He previously used to work at Dropbox, where he was leading teams in terms of search and machine learning. Along with him, we have Aaron Blankstein with us, who is an engineer at Blockstack. He holds a PhD from uh, Princeton University in distributed systems. And if you guys know your Silicon Valley, uh, I guess there was this battle between these two companies at Huli and the other guys in terms of like who gets the most distributed engineers, but like jokes apart. Our next guest is Morris Hurley, who is an engineer and advisor at Algorand. He teaches introduction to blockchain and cryptocurrency at Brown University. This is the school that Emma Watson went to. Unfortunately, she did not take the blockchain course, but I guess like we all can like live with that. He teaches about 50 students every year and he's been doing it twice. And serving as my co-host is Alberto Cuesta Canada, who is from Lisbon. He is the lead blockchain instructor at Beyond Skills. He's been programming in Solidity for two years now. He has a host of uh, programs that he has developed earlier. and According to like uh, Hacker Noon, at least, like he is one of our best writers on smart contracts and uh, the Ethereum ecosystem in general. And the topic of today's podcast would be the new offering that the teams at Blockstack and Algorand are going to come up with, which is the Clarity Programming Language. So enthusiasts in the blockchain space might know about uh, Solidity as a language that we have been using. And today we would be discussing like what were the needs to make this change and how feasible would it be for uh, an existing programmer in this space like Alberto and what does Clarity make these uh, improvements and adjustments to the existing ecosystem. So without wasting further like much time, let's dive right into it. Hello guys, how are you doing? Good. And you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Devakar. Thank you very much. So uh, before we dive into the real like programming side of things, I wanted to hear from each of you as to what was your journey like before you guys like decided to develop the Clarity programming language? Like what was the thought processes according to you that made you go, oh yes, I think I need to build a new programming language. Uh, let me be Aaron take the lead from uh, Blockstack side um, and I'm happy to add my perspective because by the time I joined Blockstack, Clarity was already well underway so Aaron can provide some historical context there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the origins of Clarity go back um, I guess a, a few years um, to when um, Blockstack was working on the design of the sort of next version of our blockchain, the Stacks blockchain, where we wanted to um, include support for uh, some kind of smart contracting functionality. Um, at the time, we did sort of a broad survey of um, how smart contracts had been used in other blockchains and what kinds of um, problems developers had been facing um, mm -hmm. in other smart contracts, in particular, like um, well known failures of other smart contracting languages where people would deploy these like very, very popular smart contracts um, and there would be failures across a number of fronts. So failures in, um, you know, bugs in the smart contracting code themselves, um, but also failures in the blockchain's ability to sort of um, appropriately assign costs and like help uh, developers understand what the costs of their smart contracts were going to be once mm -hmm. they were deployed and in use. Um, so through that survey, um, we came to sort of a number of conclusions about like what sorts of features would be very helpful um, to developers of smart contracts. Uh, and one of the things um, that we had decided was sort of 
uh, fundamental or like a chief importance to uh, smart contracts was the fact that any smart contract should be um, statically analyzable um, across a number of properties, um, one of which is that um, the every smart contract that's written should be in some sense decidable um, so that uh, the blockchain can know not only that any smart contract will um, eventually like halt, but also like what the costs associated with that smart contract are and what sort of the like full set um, of operations that could ever be performed by the smart contract are. Um, and once we came to that conclusion, it became relatively clear um, that we were going to need um, a new smart contracting language because mm -hmm. um, no smart contracting languages at that time really had that um, property. Hopefully, like now we'll have one. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to add to that a little bit, um, I personally uh, don't particularly like the framing of, you know, it's uh, that clarity or any other programming language is trying to displace some other programming language. If you just think about the smart contracts, contracting space or even like crypto as an industry in general, we're still in the very early days of sort of maturity as an industry. And by contrast, if you look at just programming languages overall, you know, you could argue that programming languages have been around for decades now. Like, why do we need more programming languages? Like, people have come up with all the programming languages and all the ideas. But the reality is that even if you look at the last 10 years, it has been sort of a boon for programming language innovation. Um, and yeah. lots of new programming languages are coming up all the time. Yeah. And, and that suggests to me that, you know, the reality is that sort of innovation is, is filling in sort of gaps that people have on current platforms. And um, optionality is good. Choice is good. Uh, and I think with Clarity, we had a set of trade-offs in mind that were not possible to sort of express or optimize for in existing languages. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that for the kinds of uh, use cases we're looking at or the kind of trade-offs that we want to make, uh, we just did not have anything. Yes, so that's awesome. uh, and so we decided to build uh, Clarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could, I, could I ask a question? Because it's very interesting what Aram said about um, being able to know with exactitude the, the costs of the smart contracts. Right now at the phase we are at yield, I am now going through all the smart contracts and trying to extract every single computation loop out of the gas that we, the, our users are going to be paying. Gas is sacred, the CEO tells me. And I feel that I actually have quite a, fee, a good feel for how much gas do things cost. Um, I mean, we have tools now like F Gas Reporter and similar, and you just need to think a little bit about the different scenarios, because at the end, smart contracts cannot be that complex in computation. You shouldn't use loops, you shouldn't use complex logic. Um, in most cases, you should know fairly well the different scenarios that you're going to run. So I feel I have a pretty good grasp of the of the gas that my smart contract is going to use. Could you, could you prove me wrong? Yeah, um, so I think that it is uh, the case that um, with appropriate tooling um, and with some like careful thought and planning, um, smart contract writers in Solidity can have a fairly good grasp of like what the gas costs are going to be and the consequences of various actions are going to be in their smart contracts. Um, however, um, if I was like a user of this smart contract, um, and I'm about to do a contract call, um, at that point, I'm having to essentially like guess, uh, what the actual, um, costs are going to be, um, when I execute your, I the contract call, um, in clarity, that's not the case because um, you get a sort of static uh, bound on the total computation that could come out of a contract call. Um, and so when I set a price in my wallet uh, for how much I want to spend to submit a contract call, um, I actually get a, an exact bound. Okay, I get that's very interesting because the best I could do in my current situation is to publish in a website our gas costs that have a minimum and a maximum. 
and the users could go there and see, oh, okay, so my transaction is going to take cost between 80,000 and 160,000, but I have no idea what will be. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. If, if I can jump in here and call attention to some of the larger issues here. So mm -hmm. when I became interested in blockchains, I thought the best way to learn it would be to teach a course. And you know, nothing uh, makes you learn something more than the sheer terror of uh, presenting it to uh, 50 <laughs> undergraduates who are going to ask her. you all kinds of uh, sharp uh, questions and cannot be uh, uh, fooled. So I ended up teaching two weeks worth of lectures. That's uh, six hours of lectures on case studies of uh, solidity um, hacks and exploits, you know, everything from reentrancy attacks to uh, various uh, gambling scams and so on. And it's a fascinating example. The students love this. You know, the, uh, some of them have told me that instead of teaching the class, I should just exploit these and become rich. But it's a little bit uh, uh, late uh, for that. But what I, the conclusion I drew from this is that Solidity was very good at getting people to write programs, or at least to think that they could write smart contracts. And, but the philosophical approach is to say, well, let's make this like JavaScript, because JavaScript is easy and broadly uh, used. But mm -hmm. the problem with JavaScript is it was intended to run against hostile browsers, not hostile hackers. And you know, the world is so, is so full of very smart, educated people with uh, dim economic prospects who know that if they can subvert your contract, it will be a life-changing opportunity. This is way, way harder than getting um, a Net Netscape browser to uh, run some, uh, some uh, display code. So I think what uh, attracted me to um, Clarity in this case was that it takes, in some sense, all the good ideas from Solidity and in some sense makes it uh, harder to, it eliminates many of the flaws, many of the things that seem like a good idea at the time and mm -hmm. completely turns things around. You know, it says that, uh, you know, we don't really need the, all this, the same complexity that um, JavaScript and Solidity introduce. We can take all the basic concepts uh, but we can do them, now that we know what we actually want to do and what we don't want to do, it's easier to restrict the language to the useful things and to cut off paths to the things that seemed like a good idea at the time, but turned out uh, to be uh, very dangerous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like at this point, I have this, like, to be honest, a non-programmer's uh, question over here about bugs. Like you mentioned the re re entrancy attacks we have like we know about the 51 percent attacks i wanted like all of you guys's like perspective on this as to what exactly are bugs for a non-programmer like is it a trade-off like is it a trade-off of sorts that you guys are like okay this could be a vulnerability but i want this feature and there is nothing that we can do about it or is it a mistake in the programming during the programming side of things. Like, I don't know, I'm just like curious about it. And I'd also like to know what is, what exactly is a re entrancy attack? I tried to read up on it, but I could never make sense of it. So a, it turns out a re entrancy attacks have been around uh, forever, but they had different names. Wow. So, so what, one of the ways of thinking about smart contracts is they're like concurrent data structures in an operating system. And this is the mm -hmm. field I worked in before I started doing a, a blockchain. And part of the reason I became interested in blockchain is so much of it is relabeled, distributed, and concurrent computing. And mm -hmm. the uh, reentrancy attack uh, used to be called a monitor invariant attack. Uh, a monitoring? M monitor invariant. So this Monitor is a technical term that uh, I'm not going to bore people by explaining, but basically it means that if you're doing something and you put things aside and you go up, go for a walk, you better lock the door behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so if you put things aside and you decide I'm going to go for a nice walk in the uh, sunlight and then while you're gone, people can come in and um, you know, do all kinds of terrible things. Uh, that doesn't happen if you lock the door. Yeah. You know, 
and so this is the, you know, when this first came out, this was completely stunned the community. The people who wrote the uh, Dow code and so on were some of the, you know, best qualified people in the world, but they made mistakes that uh, in my other concurrent programming course, I teach undergraduates about, you know, in the third week. So, uh, you know, part of the, uh, problem with learning curves like um, um, solidity is that if you're not careful, you recapitulate and remake classical mistakes. Mm -hmm. But because there isn't communication between these communities, uh, people, instead of getting a C on your uh, midterm, you will lose uh, $40 million. <laughs> and this is what makes blockchains uh, so much fun. <laughs> but many of the issues are the same old, same old uh, things, uh, but... Uh, but currently unrecognized. So, you know, mm -hmm. while I, th I think, uh, you know, Ethereum and Solidity are brilliant achievements, you know, Fortran was also a brilliant achievement and I think it's <laughs> time, time to move on. And, yeah. uh, you know, this is why I'm you know, personally excited about uh, a Clarity and its, uh, you know, cousins. I, go yeah, ahead. I just think that's my, my cue to enter and defend Solidity after that sort of passion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first thing is that, uh, but you were asking about what are bugs, what is vulnerability, what is that you choose as a programmer. If you see a vulnerability, you will close it immediately. You don't choose to have vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. But the way you code a program um, gives you opportunities to mess up, basically. We sometimes call it the, the attack surface. So if I choose to code my smart contracts as a collection of disparate smart contracts that do lots of things, I will have a lot of attack surface because I will have a lot of smart contracts with lots of points where people can do different things. So you try to control the complexity of your solution and how mm -hmm. you code things so that it's as simple and as, and as understandable as possible. The more complicated you are, the more complex your program is, the more chances is that you will have some mess up in some point that someone will uh, know how to exploit who didn't know at the time that is exploited. And that's compounded by the fact that smart contracts are difficult to upgrade. So that's why you can mess up and that stays there forever and your contract is moving millions of dollars and the DAO hack happens. Someone takes all the money because you messed up. Mm -hmm. um, but that also, uh, that's where I want to, to project something that Maurice said. The community in Ethereum is actually quite interesting because it's the first programming community I've ever seen where auditing code is actually a thing. And uh, in the days of the DAO hack, I don't know if the DAO smart contracts were audited at all, but uh, quite after that, uh, you, no one dreams of getting any smart contract to the, um, to the mainnet without having recognized experts in the field that do that as a living, going through every single line of code and finding all those mistakes that someone has done in the past, making sure that you close them. And any kind of risky behavior that you could have in your smart contract gets raised up. So we do learn from our past mistakes and we try not to repeat the, the same mistakes. So now you shouldn't see any um, smart contract out there managing millions of dollars that is open to re-entrancy, for example, because that happened with the DAO hack. That said, um, Ethereum uh, and any blockchain by their global nature, uh, they are incredibly complex and people are adding applications all the time. Blockstack has already 140 applications and people are inventing things all the time. So you never know how things might happen in a few months or and so and which new vulnerabilities might happen. For example, flash minting and flash trading is something that no one had thought about until a few months ago. And then someone thought, oh, I can create cryptocurrency and destroy cryptocurrency in the same transaction. And that allows for all these new things to happen. And suddenly lots of people got hacked because they, they didn't know that that could be done. In that sense, clarity is very interesting because I assume that that with clarity cannot happen. But at least don't bash me in the thing of repeating the same mistakes. We try not to do that very, very hard. 
Yeah, and I, I don't think this is like a, a criticism on at least Solidity or programmers in my mind. I think my my perspective looking at this, you know, if you look at any programming language, if you look at something like C++ has been around for a while, has a lot of features. Uh, and if you're like someone who's using like C++ metaprogramming with templates, um, it's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not that the programmers are doing anything bad, it's that the language is giving you possibilities. And if there are ways to do things um, and sort of dark corners to explore, like people will go out and explore them. Um, and that's not a fault necessarily. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier when I was saying that, you know, with Clarity, we're trying to express a different set of trade-offs. And we're saying that, mm -hmm. you know, we want it to be harder to make certain class of mistakes. Uh, and we want to make it easier to be safe by default. Mm -hmm. We want to optimize safety over convenience. So even if, uh, you know, maybe the, the syntax is less familiar to people than JavaScript, we think it's a good trade-off because, uh, you know, as uh, you were saying earlier, um, Alberto, that, with smart contracts, you know, upgrading smart contracts is higher. Like the cost of a bug is, is sort of infinitely more than the cost of a bug in any other programming environment because you can't just simply deploy a, a fix and upgrade. And so yeah. the, the, more, um, the more we can introduce in the system itself that uh, tries to surface yeah. common classes of bugs, makes it easier for people to understand what's going on. You talked about attack surface. That's another kind of design principle in Clarity at least in the, the block stack implementation, for example, we don't have a compiler, right? So there's the, the clarity, you write a smart contract, that smart contract source code is essentially embedded as is on the blockchain. So anyone can read it, inspect it, and then it runs through an interpreter. There's no compiler in between. Um, and so that's also with an intention of minimizing the attack surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, Aaron, I have a question for you. Remember the Microsoft phone or the Windows phone? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think like maybe you know where I'm like trying to go with it is that there was the iPhone, there was the Android, and then Microsoft decided to come up with the Windows phone. The problem that they faced was that the developers did not want to develop for the Windows phone. They never had the Instagram app, which is probably sacrilegious for the Gen Z or the millennials of today. So like, how do you convince the programmers to make the switch or at least make their programs compatible with clarity or maybe how do you, how do you start to get these guys to develop for your program or like to use clarity to develop their programs? Right. Um, so I think that there's uh, a number of ways to answer that question. So one is that uh, I think that really unlike phones uh, at that point in time, like the community, developer community for um, decentralized uh, applications or decentralized web and uh, smart contracts is like so nascent compared to like the broader ecosystem of developers that mm -hmm. there's not as much um, buy-in or expectation to any one way of programming. Um, that was like not really the case when the Windows phone came out. Those were uh, both the iPhone and Androids were like fairly developed ecosystems with like lots and lots of users and there was a lot of incentive to keep developers on. Mm -hmm. iPhones and Androids. That's not really the case today um, in smart contract languages. And then um, on top of that, I think that one of the things that is interesting about smart contract developers right now is that a lot of the interest in smart contracts is like um, driven by uh, really just like enthusiastic um, developers who want to experiment with um, this like new, whole new paradigm of like building applications. Um, and so there's a ton of experimentation going on. And in a community with a ton of experimentation, I think you'll find that there are people that are more willing to look at programming languages that might be a little less familiar on the surface to them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's a ton of opportunity um, to get people excited um, about programming in Clarity. 
And then finally, what I would say is that with um, good tooling, with good library support, um, all of those kinds of things, um, clarity is like not um, just that huge of a like burden for programmers to learn. Like when you look at it at first, it, it might be sort of an unfamiliar um, syntax or structure, um, but uh, I think that people will be able to use it. So. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One question. I do want to use it, but the problem that I have is that MakerDAO and Compound and Avi and all these um, applications with huge value that I want to integrate with, they are all in Ethereum. So do you think there would be the chance for Clarity as a programming language to be um, ported somehow to work in the Ethereum network, or does it need to be necessarily work on the block stack or Algorand blockchain? Um, uh, go ahead, Dylan. It's fine, Aaron. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I would say that it's it's uh, definitely the case that you could port um, Clarity to the Ethereum platform, like. It's certainly true that you could write something like an EVM compiler or Clarity um, if you so desired. Um, so that is an avenue that people could take. Um, but yeah. So well, we would lose the advantage of not being a compiled language. I can see that. Um, but would could we still keep the, the advantage of being a non turing complete language and being completely deterministic and undecidable? Um, so yes, the language itself would still be deterministic and decidable. Uh, however, your compiler um, may introduce uh, bugs. Yeah, bugs yeah, and non-determinism, right? Is the EVM language itself supports the yeah, the AVM works on bytecode, so that's a barrier that won't be surfaced. That's that's very interesting because that's uh, I think that goes a little bit with the Windows versus iPhone question of itself. Um, you need to get users to adopt your your tool in order for your tool to become more mature. Because I can do something that is really cool and clarity sounds really cool, but you need users. You need someone to to use it and. The problem right now for, for someone like you is that right now you have, I don't know how much, uh, $2 billion of value or more locked in the, in the DeFi applications in Ethereum. So that's something that makes uh, real applications possible, not just amateur experimentation, but people actually doing real world stuff in there. And so that's a, a very big carrot for me, I'm going to code with the one that doesn't use clarity, unfortunately. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments there. I mean, this is really, the question is less about, you know, clarity or solidity. I think what you're really hinting at is that, you know, Ethereum has traction in a certain sector and until you find sort of users, uh, you know, it's hard to, to create that feedback loop of users and developers improving yeah. and helping the ecosystem mature. Um, mm -hmm. so, so two quick comments there, like first, um, on the question of just clarity as a language itself, uh, you know, we obviously uh, are super excited about the partnership with Algorand and that itself is a proof point that clarity as a language can exist on multiple different blockchains. And, and I would certainly hope that ideas from clarity maybe inspire, um, you know, there is, there are other alternatives even on Ethereum, right? There is Viper. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so people are experimenting and I would hope that, you know, people bring ideas from clarity onto the Ethereum platform in whatever way makes sense. Um, the second thing to kind of reiterate what Aaron was saying, you know, the total number of crypto developers is less than 10,000. The total number of developers in the world is in the millions. Uh, and so I, I think of sort of where we are in terms of crypto, it's a growing pie. And so I'm less concerned or interested about, you know, can we take away market share uh, mm -hmm. from Ethereum for DeFi products? If that happens, fine. If it doesn't happen, it's okay. Also okay, because you know, we're all trying to create an entire new industry and there's plenty of room for all of these um, uh, chains to grow. And at the end of the day, you know, products and blockchains that are able to really find, uh, you know, the uh, product market fit and helping actually solve meaningful developer and user problems uh, will end up carving out um, their market share appropriately. 
so so again like i'm i'm not like at least my framing of this is not that we're trying to you know like should compound be built on clarity uh, i don't know uh, you know time will tell but right now if it's you know solidity is working for them great that's awesome i should point out also that um, both the blockstax and algorand uh, blockchains they have very different plumbing they uh, look mm -hmm. different in uh, many uh, ways and uh, on the other hand both Algorand and, and uh, Blockstax think that Clarity is um, going to be very useful for their kinds of mm -hmm. applications. So I don't think, you shouldn't think of uh, Clarity as being, um, I think, stuck to a particular blockchain architecture. It's uh, flexible enough that you can uh, do things with very different execution models. And, mm -hmm. you know, don't, I think don't get me wrong, I, I asked those questions because I, I think it would be awesome if I could, uh, use clarity it sounds like a really really interesting idea I think it's yeah nice. let me mention like just one other feature that i think even just as a user whether i'm on ethereum or any other platform like i would love to have so clarity has this notion of post conditions where regardless of whoever wrote the smart contract uh, and if you're calling a smart contract that you know about or you don't know about you can specify post conditions that constrain what that smart contract is able to do in terms of like its eventual outcomes so you could say, no matter what the smart contract does internally, I want to make sure it cannot spend more than you know X amount of uh, Ethereum from my wallet. Uh, and, and so you can specify a number of these post conditions as a user. So I like the fact that you know, Clarity allows a user to express their own sort of boundaries and envelopes on what a smart contract is able to do. And that's just kind of, again, like you know, one of the, the features that we think is like, it helps uh, demystify uh, what a smart contract is doing and what you can expect it to do both for users and for developers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a saying in my, in my home country, India, which is like, if you want to teach somebody something, catch them young. And I guess like, uh, that's well, a lot of that is going to be up to our professors. And so my next question is for Morris, like, let's say there's this class on clarity 101 and a kid like myself who's over there, like probably reached over there, I don't know how, by luck or whatever. And he asks you, Professor, how does Clarity compare to, let's say, C++? Can I do anything else with it apart from smart contracts? And why should I take the time to learn it? I would say that Clarity itself is focused on smart contracts. I don't think you would want to use that to write an operating system or a, a file system mm -hmm. or any distributed system that isn't a kind of a smart contract. Uh, but for example, the, it used to be that the beginning MIT computer science course uh, taught a language called Scheme, which is a relative of a Lisp, which is a distant relative actually of uh, Clarity. And this is nice because it helps you explain basic ideas to students without getting bogged down in uh, syntax and uh, complicated uh, semantics. So I think Clarity would also be a good introduction to writing a smart uh, contracts, simply because it is, you know, it's simple, it's not Turing complete, it doesn't have the same complexities and pitfalls Mm -hmm. that uh, other uh, languages, and I'm, I'm not singling out Solidity here, uh, there are other languages that are also have some you know, very sophisticated um, vulnerabilities. So uh, to that respect, I think uh, the clarity and the kind of approach that it takes of, of having a kind of simple minimalistic um, interface is uh, exactly the kind of thing you want to lure people into writing smart contracts and to understand the basic uh, problems, which again are, are very different from the kinds of things you run into with regular code, where a bug is something that happens. It's not the malicious, uh, it's not a malicious attack by uh, somebody who's spending all day trying to uh, figure out how to undermine your code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is interesting. And would any, uh, like, would like any of you be open to sharing your screen and showing us like what does a very smallish smart contract, let's say, transfer money from person A to uh, person B look like on the clarity side of things? Like how fast is it to like boot up clarity or like whatever is the word that is programming, that is like programming appropriate. 
and then like maybe we could discuss about like what are the pros and cons for clarity as compared to somebody else and um, well you do that um i wanted to ask a question because in the early days of solidity there was um, a lot of jokes and a lot of laughter that someone would name solidity for a programming language that was notoriously fragile i mean you call it so solidity solid but then you lose millions of dollars it kind of doesn't care i hope that the code that you are going to show me with clarity is clear otherwise people might take the same stuff at you and are you are you pulling up a sample contract yeah i'm gonna pull up okay. um i guess a sample from our uh our documentation okay uh, so yeah one second let's see thank you for that Aaron. i found a, a nice article if you want where it put a clarity and a and uh here it is let's see how can i i cannot share my screen but maybe someone can share this here because yeah I'll, okay, I'll share um, let's see um, so this is, um, I'm going to share, it's not exactly the simplest, oh, okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, I find now. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit small there in the center, maybe I can zoom. Uh, how can I zoom? Zoom, 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 zoom. Tup, 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 tup. Yeah, so I think that here we have the clarity uh, function and here is the solidity function that was also chosen because it's dodgy stuff that no one would do anymore, sending um, ether like that. But anyway, could you walk us through the clarity code? Yeah, sure. Um, so what's happening in this clarity code is we're, we're defining two functions. Um, one of the functions um, is a uh, private function um, for fetching um, the uh, um, uh, balance for a particular user. Um, this is implemented in um, a way that we sort of would no longer really recommend people implement. So like this is implemented using just our um, notion of like data maps, which is just an arbitrary storage system for a smart contract, um, where this data map is um, representing uh, user sort of token balances, some whatever new fungible token that you've created. Um, and you can see in the get balance function, um, what it's doing is calling um, fetch entry for the user balances of the uh, transaction sender. Um, and then when it gets that um, result, um, it tries to pull the balance out of the um, database result. Um, and if the database returned like null or there was no existing account balance for that user, um, then it defaults to zero. Um, now, when you look at that get balance function, you might say to yourself, okay, that's like a fairly complex thing um, just to get a user's balance out of a database. Um, however, um, the reason that it's that complex is because actually like fetching a user's balance and implementing these account balances has a ton of pitfalls. Um, you know, you have to define behavior for like accounts that don't previously exist. Um, you want to make sure that like account balances can't go below zero. Um, you want to make sure that um, a given user account can't have multiple kinds of balances. Um, 
And so what the clarity code there shows you is that like clarity actually doesn't let you make those kinds of mistakes because most of those kinds of mistakes would turn out to be uh, type errors. Um, so if in this get balance function, you had failed to provide a default, um, then the result, the return type of this function um, actually wouldn't have been an integer. It would have instead been like a option type which is like an integer or null. Um, and so you would get a type error if you tried to use it as if it was just a plain integer. Um, yeah, so that's what's going on in that get balance function. Um, and then the next uh, function that we're defining is a withdraw balance. Um, this is a public function, which indicates it can be called by users by like uh, broadcasting a transaction on the blockchain or called by a contract call from different smart contract. Um, the withdraw balance function um, is doing a number of things. So first it's like trying to figure out the total amount to withdraw by getting the user's current balance. Um, and then it ensures that this amount to be withdrawn is like greater than zero. So you can't withdraw a negative amount. Um, and then um, it actually sort of performs the withdrawal. And when you compare it to what's going on with the Solidity code, um, I guess it's true that the Solidity code um, is sort of much more concise, um, but it's not actually performing the necessary safety checks um, as you highlighted, right? Like this is Solidity code that does a ton of things that like no one should ever do. Um, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, there's a reason yeah, the clarity code right. is more complex, but yeah, yeah right. I, I sometimes um, compare coding smart contracts in solidity to tightrope walking. You need to know what you are doing or you will fall. But yeah, a, a tightrope is a very simple way of going from A to B. Um, if you would put a handrail or a couple of them, it would be more complex, but you would also not fall down to the charts. There, so there's the a class. Classical programming language design principle that expensive things should look expensive. For smart contracts, uh, dangerous things should look dangerous. And, uh, and I, I think uh, Clarity does a good job of making dangerous things look dangerous and uh, not, uh, not as easy as, uh, as sometimes um, Solidity makes them look. That, that's absolutely fair. Making very dangerous things in Solidity can look very, very uh, innocent. Okay. You're muted, it's up. Yeah, have you like stopped sharing screens now? Yeah. Um, perfect. So uh, next up, I guess like the next steps for you guys would be, um, I saw that it was mentioned over there about 140 block stab apps can start like playing with clarity like right away. So uh, how many like dabs do you think uh, would be open to such a change within your own ecosystem? Cause you have your own surveying platforms and you like probably have an idea as to like these are the target group of people who would be very willing to make the switch. These are, let's say, the pliables, or as they call in US politics, the swing states. And then we have these people who would never change. So what is your like what does your survey tell you about that? I can take that. So um uh, BlockTech, I mean, if you're just looking at number of applications that have been developed and deployed on our network, it's actually much closer to 400, um, not 140. Um, in terms of, you know, how to think about smart contract and like who's going to switch, um, uh, again, like if you look historically, our stack, um, the, the developer libraries that we offered and our, uh, the legacy version of our blockchain actually does not have any smart contract capability. And so almost by design, all of the applications that exist today on our network, none of them have needed any smart contract capability because it did not exist. So people have just built what they could build with the things that they had available. And so the way we think about smart contract is we're giving developers a new toolkit, a new set of features 
uh, and that should enable and, and open up new use cases. So it's less about switching applications that are currently on Blockstack to start using Clarity, but it's more about what new applications people can build, what kind of new features they can implement in their existing applications. Um, so what we're trying to optimize for is experimentation, um, is innovation, uh, and, and not really thinking of it as, you know, how do we get people to switch over uh, to using Clarity where they were not using it before. Um, so, so that's just, you know, just to, to set the framing of, you know, the, the applications historically and where we're going next. Um, in terms of concrete numbers, uh, you know, we have our testnet uh, live currently where developers are testing out Clarity. Um, we had a, uh, we are holding a number of hackathons to educate uh, our developers um, and to get them to try things out. Um, and those have been going very well, like just on the testnet and through these hackathons. I think the first hackathon we saw 37 uh, submissions um, in the hackathon with you know number of different use cases. And for me, you know, it's really heartening to see the community kind of stepping up and building uh, you know tools and services uh, sort of beyond what we could have imagined. Um, and uh, I can I can send a few examples uh, after the call uh, if you're interested in taking a look at what people have built uh, already using Clarity. Definitely, that would be helpful, and we would like add those links to the description of this uh, podcast when we send it out live, so that people can check it out too. I also wanted to know about uh, versioning numbers, or like, how do you guys like version it? Like, is it Clarity 1.0 right now, or is this another number associated with it? Like, again, these are like non-programmer questions, just from a person who was interested in technology. And let's assume that what you have right now is Clarity 1.0. And I know that programmers love to think way ahead. So what does Clarity 2.0 look like from where you are, from where you are sitting right now? Right, so I, I think that probably the way to think about that um, question is that Clarity right now is somewhere close to Clarity 0 0.1, right? Like somewhere near alpha is, or maybe not alpha, but beta. I would say it's pre-Clarity 1.0 um, because there's we're still sort of actively adding features. Um, there's not like a ton that we are actively adding that, um, it's going to like radically change the nature of the language, but there's there's many features that um, I think both uh, we at Blockstack and at, at Hunger Island would like to see in the language to make things a lot easier for programmers, less duplication in smart contracts. Um, Just for context, I think the first Solidity version I coded for was 0 0.3 something now it's 0 0.7 we are not 1.0 at all but yeah that um i would i would think that from now until you get go 1.0 everything will be unrecognizable and the amount of users that you will have it will be uh, much bigger i actually like very much the what the bucket said that it's not about stealing users from solidity is that there is so much space to grow that you can grow to have a million users and everyone can grow to have a million users side to side. So that sounds very good for your programming language. Perfect. So like now, uh, because we are approaching the one hour mark and we'd like to uh, wrap it up, I'd like to ask for any closing statements that we have from the Algorand side of things. And I'm very interesting, interested to know more about what does Algorand take away from this partnership? Well, I think there are a whole class of smart contracts applications that uh, require something like Solidity. Up until mm -hmm. now, uh, Algorand has been very successful using uh, level one contracts, uh, using uh, uh, other kinds of uh, approaches to programming uh, transactions. There are a whole class of transactions that, that really need something like, uh, something that looks more like a theory of smart contracts. And this is exactly the kind of thing where we think uh, clarity would be uh, helpful. We're still in very early days. We've only been uh, doing this uh, collaboration for, uh, for a few months now. And uh, we're still in the you know, honeymoon full of enthusiasm uh, stage. 
but I think this is a, an ongoing um, project. And I think that we have lots of applications in mind. We know that we have um, clients and customers who are interested mm -hmm. in these applications. So we're, we're very positive about pushing this forward. Uh, it's the nature of language design that everyone has small has very strong opinions and everyone thinks they know everything. So we're looking forward to a, a vigorous uh, discussion on the future features in the uh, you know, later versions of uh, Clarity. Agreed with you on that. As a non-programmer, I can totally attest to the fact that programmers always think that they know everything. <laughs> but I guess we can say the same about everybody. Look at the politicians. Alberto, like, would you like to add something about uh, what's your key takeaway from this conversation? Uh, would you want um, to give Clarity a try? I, I think that Clarity is very exciting. Is the until I wasn't until I was invited to this podcast. Podcast I hadn't thought about uh, during incompleteness as being a positive thing. So I've learned something today. I think that Clarity is. Uh, really exciting and I have to say that despite being here the solidity guy I have the utmost respect for what you guys are doing doing your own programming language is an, an imaginable feat for me it's something that I imagine to be incredibly complex so hats off to you to actually taking that step I find it really impressive and the best of luck of, with clarity I hope I will be able to use it sometime soon Thank you, Alberto. Uh, last but not least, we have Aaron. And I'd like to ask him, uh, I guess like maybe it's a personal question of sorts. Like what was the first programming language that you learned? And uh, if you were to compare the experience of learning that with clarity, what would you say now? Um, I think uh, in all likelihood, the, the first programming language that I learned, I think, was maybe Logo. Um, and uh, the experience of programming a turtle to draw spirals around um, my <laughs> monitor was um, was very, it was wildly different, I'd say, than the experience Agreed. of Clarity. Um, but what I would say is that um, there, there is actually um, somewhat of a link between the two in that um, in both cases, um, there was like sort of a joy in the experimentation and the unknown. I mean, I guess when I was a child, like the, we were exploring things that were known to other people, but to me, there was like a joy of discovery. Um, whereas I think today with Clarity, there's, I think there's a lot of joy of discovery of like what new kinds of applications people can be building in these ecosystems. I think that there's, um, so much untapped potential um, in smart contracts and in uh, programmable blockchains um, that there is um, sort of a similar joy of discovery there. Definitely. Thank you for that, Aaron. And like, thank you for making me realize that the first programming languages that we learned were in school and they were like logo. I remember mine was basic. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. And with that, let's call it a wrap. Thank you very much, Aaron, Morris, Alberto, Devakar, for being on the call and for joining a part of the Hacker Noon podcast. Would uh, any of you like to say a few things to the Hacker Noon community? Read my article. I for that. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Nothing from Algor and Morris. Well, I'm just. Um want to express enthusiasm for this entire project. And as I think it would be great to get as many people involved with this as possible, because uh, the more ideas, uh, the better, the more experiences, the better, the more we learn about what people actually need to do and what people don't actually need to do, the, the better off uh, we will all be. Definitely, definitely. Some really wise words from you over there. Thank you very much, Morris. And with thing, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. To the, to the please vote for me in the Nunes as well. Now that <laughs> nominated me, please vote. It would make me very happy. Definitely, we would have an entire social media for sure. That don't worry about. That. But yeah, on that like nice note. 
thank you all of you for joining the happy noon podcast and let's like uh, revisit this conversation sometime soon hopefully when clarity is on the words of let's say signing up its millionth app so yeah best wishes from from the hacker noon team thank you guys okay thanks